All right, last time we were working in this section and um, we talked about this idea of separating variables um, and we sort of discussed the fact that on all the ones we've seen to this point, that was possible to do, right? We had this idea of getting all the x's on one side and the dx's and all the y's and the dy's on the other side and then we can integrate using all the wonderful integration um, that you guys know how to do. Um, but as you might imagine, um, obviously that's not always quite that clean and simple. That's why we started there is because those ones did have that property. All right, so we looked at these ideas of separating variables and we had gotten through to the point of talking about one other part of the description in the header here, and that phrase says homogeneous equations. <coughs> All right, so today we're going to start with this idea of a homogeneous function. So a homogeneous function of degree n is a function that's not separable. So, in other words, it cannot be separated um, using the methods we were doing before. We can't just add and subtract, multiply, divide, and move things around. But we are able to make it separable if we change some variables. Now, you guys know how to change variables. That's equivalent to doing something like a u substitution that you've seen before. So we can do a, a change of variables. And the change of variables has the form that if we replace the x variable with tx and the y variable with ty, that's equivalent to being able to factor out a power of t. So we have t to some power n, and that n is called the degree. And then a homogeneous differential equation actually has this particular form. Some function of x and y times dx plus some other function of x and y times dy equals 0. And m and n, m and n are homogeneous functions of the same degree. So M and N have the property of the first definition on this slide. They have the property of being able to do this change of variable business. So if we're able to do this change of variable business and get a function of this type, it's called a homogeneous differential equation. So we are going to use that first definition, that first description, and we're going to show you how to do a problem where we're identifying something as being homogeneous and having a certain degree, finding that degree. And then we're going to do an example about the tx, ty. And you guys know, of course, with all the wonderful math that you've done to this point, that that just means replacing the x with tx and replacing the y with ty. So this is tx times ty on top over the square root of tx quantity squared plus ty quantity squared. All right, so in terms of cleaning things up, what would you like to do first? Let's start with the numerator. What would we, what could, how else could we write the numerator? Sure. t squared times xy. And that's a good first step towards recognizing, can I factor or can I remove that, that t value out in front somehow and leave the original part, which was xy originally in the numerator, by itself? How about the denominator? Can I just square each of those pieces individually first? Sure. So I can write this as t squared x squared plus t squared, y squared. Then what? Oh, I don't need to do that. All right, so the denominator, Jordan tells me, basically had both of the pieces of it underneath that radical had a t squared in it. So would it be something like this, Jordan? Is that what you had in mind? Great. Does everybody agree with that? Look good? Now what? Separate the square root of t squared and the x squared plus y squared. 
Very good, Michaela. That's exactly what we want to do. That's a property you probably haven't seen used in quite a while. We can separate the square roots because it's multiplication. We can't do it with addition and subtraction, but these are multiplied together, right? So I can separate it like that. What's the square root of t squared? T. Well, isn't that friendly? And then what happens? Yep, that t in the denominator will cancel with one of the t's in the numerator. So I'm left with a t times xy over the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? Well, what's in parentheses was exactly what I started with, wasn't it? That's the f of xy that I began the problem with which means I was able to do exactly what I was hoping I would be able to do. I was able to turn it into the right-hand side of this equation with a t factored out. What's the exponent on that t? One. One. So we actually found that since we were able to factor that t out, that it is homogeneous, and it has a degree one because the degree of what that t is factored out is the degree of the equation, it's the de homogeneous degree. Homogeneous of degree one, because this under here, right here, is understood to be a number one. Any questions on that? This problem is an exercise in algebra, agreed? There's no calculus here whatsoever, just algebra. You're changing a variable and you're trying to factor something out in the end. All right, so let's see where that fits in with calculus then. All right, so if you have one of these homogeneous equations, this mxy dx plus n of xy dy and n equals zero, and this is homogeneous, then it can be transformed from that, that form, that form that's already in, it can be transformed into a separable differential equation. And it be, should be no surprise how it would be done. It's done by that same substitution that we just used, right? But you see them using a V instead of a T. There's nothing special about that. So the substitution that they're using is to substitute in TX in place of Y. Okay, so no, we're not replacing the X and the Y, but we're replacing the Y with, in this case, VX. And V, in order to make this work, is a different, differentiable function of, of X. So we're going to do a substitution. In place of y, we're going to replace all the y's with the vx. And when we do that, we're actually going to be able to separate the function um, with the x's on one side and the v's on the other because we won't have any y's left. Okay, does everybody have that down? All right, so let's do an equation where this is happening. Okay, this has a similar feel to the last example that we did. Um, we have the same problem that we can't separate it, right? You know, it doesn't have that same that ability that we had in the last you know, few sections of being able to put all the x's on one side and all the y's on the other side. Um, I could try to sort of do that, um, but I run into problems because if I take that 2xy to the other side, I can certainly leave the 2 and the y there and I can move the x back over, but the problem is because I have the plus y squared, while I could move the y squared to the other side, it isn't multiplied by dy. In order to be able to take a derivative, or an antiderivative, excuse me, I actually have to have the function multiplied by dy to make that work, and this wouldn't have that. So this is not separable. All right, so what we want to do first is we want to get it into the form of m of xy times dx and an n of xy times dy set equal to zero. Okay, so I want everything on the same side, and I'm going to have a portion of stuff multiplied by, by dx, and I'm having a portion of stuff multiplied by dy. All right, so taking a look at where we are on this problem, the first thing I would want to do is I would want to write this as dy dx. And the next thing I'm going to do is, I'm, I know we're not moving them all on the same side right away, but I'm going to cross multiply. Because what that's going to do is it's going to get everything multiplied by either the dx or the dy. Does that make sense? And there's other ways that we could represent that, but this one just kind of works cleanly to think about it that way. So this is 2xy dy equals, and then make sure put that numerator in parentheses, x squared plus y squared times the dx. 
And then we can move it on to the same side just by using a little subtraction. So this is 2xy dy minus x squared plus y squared dx equals 0. Okay, so I guess I have the dx and the dy backwards. We'll rewrite it so that they're in the right order. Um, but does that look okay? This is a function that's got addition, so it really doesn't even matter the order so much, but if you want to see it rewritten, then one of your functions is negative x squared plus y squared dx plus the 2xy dy equals 0. That's the actual form that it shows up in. All right, so the whole key in th theorem 6.2 says that I'm supposed to be able to substitute in y as a vx. Now, there's a problem with that because I, I can certainly replace this y squared and this y with vx, but what's the problem? I need to replace the dy as well, don't I? And the unfortunate thing is that dy is not so clean. Why do I say that? What is dy over here going to be? Is it? It's actually a product of v times x, isn't it? y is v times x. So if I take the derivative of y, I have to do the product rule. So v is like a constant. Well, v is not a constant. v is a variable. Yeah, v is a variable and x is a variable. So since these are both variables, In fact, are not, not only are they both variables, but it actually talks down here, it says v is a differentiable function of x. So it tells you v is a function in terms of x. So it's kind of like if we, like when we did implicit differentiation and you had y times x, and if you tried to take the derivative, you had to do the two pieces of the derivative, right? Same idea here. So we're actually going to have to do both pieces of this derivative. So the first way that I, that I start on these, I always write down the first piece first. Uh, I know some of you do that the other, in the other order, which is fine. And the derivative of x, when we did implicit differentiation, I understand we always said that that was 1. Here, we're actually going to write down the dx for that. So, so v times dx. And then I need the derivative of v, which would be dv times the x originally. And since that looks weird, I will rewrite this. So dy is actually v dx plus x dv. Okay. Now, here's the thing. It, it's always going to be that, right? Because the substitution you're making is always going to be y equal vx. So the substitution for dy is always going to be v dx plus x dv. It's not going to change. You're not going to have to refigure this every time and, oh my goodness, now it's something a little bit different. It's not going to be. So it's the exact same substitution every time. So now we're able to use these two pieces and make a substitution into the equation that we had before. So I've got negative. I've got x squared plus. Now my y is vx. This is vx quantity squared times dx, all of that. Now I have plus 2x and I have vx, and then my dv is v dx plus x dv, and all of that is equal now to zero. All right, does that look okay? Do I have all the pieces in there right? Now it's, it's time for some algebra, right? We've got to collect some things and work through some things, and right now it's a mess. The whole reason, now remember, the whole reason that we made this substitution is because by making this substitution, we're going to be able to separate the variables. We're going to be able to, in the end, after we do some work, get everything with x on one side and get everything with v on the other side. That's the reason we did this. So keep that in mind because you can start getting all sorts of carried away if you're not careful about what my goal is, where am I headed. So I'm headed towards moving all the x's to one side and all the v's to the other side. Okay, so in order to do that, let's clean things up a little bit. And I'm actually going to see to show this as all flat out multiplied distributed out. 
Some of you probably don't need to see all of it that way, but some of you do. And that's okay. Either way you want to handle it's all right, but I'm going to handle it in the most broad um, sort of sense of how to handle this right now. So I've got this um, right now. I'm going to distribute my dv. So I've actually got negative x squared dv to start with. Sorry, not dv, dx. Let me get the right letter there, dx. And then right here I've got a negative. I've got v squared x squared dx. Is that good for everybody? All right. Now, right in here, this piece right here is actually 2x squared v, right? So all of this 2x squared v is going to be distributed to each of these pieces. So I've got 2x squared v, and then I've got the v times the v, so I've got v squared dx. And then I've got that 2x squared, so that's the 2, but then the x squared is multiplied by another x, so now this is x cubed, and I've got a v times dv. Did yours work out the same way? You have all those same terms written in there, perhaps in a different order, depending on how you did that um, derivative a little bit ago, but everybody has all the same pieces. Okay, good. What I need to do now is I need to collect all of the dx's together and all of the dy's together, because I need to be able to factor that piece out. Okay, make sure that's how I did it when I was working on this before. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I've got, ooh, I've got a lot of dx's, don't I? What a mess. Hmm. All right, so let's leave, um, let's leave the dx's on the left and let's move that dv to the right. Would that be okay? Good with everybody? All right, so right now I'm going to factor out everything that's multiplied by dx. So that's a negative x squared. I have a minus v squared x squared. And I have a plus 2x squared v squared. And all of that, if I have that, is then multiplied by dx. And if I move the other piece, I've got negative 2x cubed v dv. Now, by doing that, I've actually determined that I want my x's on the left and my v's on the right. Because I've got the dx on the left and I've got the dv on the right. Make sense? Now, right now, I don't have all of that done. I've got some pieces where they do not belong right now. Agreed? So what, what's got to move? Well, if you look at everything on the left, I've got some x's, I'm sorry, some v's on the left that need to move. Agreed? So what needs to move? Hang on just a second. You can see where I was in my, put, my paper that I was writing things down. Oh, do I have something that combines on the left? I do. I didn't even notice it right there. Do you guys see it too? These two pieces combine, don't they? Let's combine those so we don't keep writing them. How do those combine? Oh, will it be? Oh, the negative x squared and then positive. What was that, Janet? Um, v, or x squared, v squared. Okay, x squared, v squared. Let's do that step before I start trying to move anything else. Oh, I'm happier with that. That's good. All right, so I've got some v's, or at least I have a v squared on the left that really I don't want it there. Agreed? So how am I going to separate the x squared plus x squared v squared, negative x squared plus x squared v squared, apart so that a part of it is written with terms of x and the other part is written in terms of v? Factor out an x squared. You got it. So if I take the x squared out... I'm going to be left with negative 1 plus v squared. Does everybody see that okay? And then on the right-hand side, I still have the 2x cubed v dv. I think I've got some unnecessary negatives going on, but that's okay too. We can deal with it later. All right, so I need to have all the x's on the left and all the v's on the right. So what do I need to do on the left-hand side to make that happen? Yeah, divide by negative 1 plus v squared. And if I do it to the left, I have to do it to the right. What do I have to do on the right side to get only v's over there? I could just divide by the x cubed. Yep. 
All right, so portions of this reduce, right? Those two completely cancel. But now I have x squared over x cubed, which means on the left-hand side, what do I have? Right, 1 over x dx. How nice is that? You guys know that antiderivative. Um, what about the right-hand side? Well, let's see. The x cubed canceled. Here I've got that negative 2v over negative 1 plus v squared dv. It's not as pretty on the right, is it? But do you know what to do on the right? Okay, Taylor's smiling, so she's got something thinking. What do you, what do you got, Taylor? U substitution. It is U substitution. What would you like to let your U be? Okay, so you've actually changed, it sounds like, your signs, yeah? No, no, that's good. We'll do it. So you've changed all your signs to make that positive, positive, and then negative in the middle here, right? That sounds good. All right, if you don't want to change your signs, it, it, you'll still get the same answer at the end. So right now, you've got 2v over 1 minus v squared dv. Okay, so you said your u was 1 minus v squared. So then what is du? Negative 2v squared. Right, negative 2v dv, which is just nearly what we've got on top. It's missing a negative, which we just pulled out, but that's okay. We'll put it back in now. Okay, so let's take this piece and let's do this now. Let me move it onto the next slide. Okay, what's the antiderivative on the left? Okay, now I'm going to write this, and some of you keep forgetting as you're doing your homework. Remember that that's an absolute value, okay? Natural log absolute value x. And then what's going to happen on the right? Well, we said we've got a u substitution, so let's actually make it. We had said this is 1 minus v squared. dv is negative 2v dv. I wrote that wrong. It's du is negative 2 dv dv. So I can have that negative 1 moved. I'll have a negative integral of du over u. You guys like that, don't you? Because you know that antiderivative. I know you do. What's that antiderivative then on the right? Negative natural log of absolute value of u. Yep, which is 1 minus v squared. And I kind of feel like we might be missing something. We need a plus c somewhere. We're going to sort of simplify this in a minute. So for right now, I'm going to write plus c1. Okay, is everybody good to this point? Okay, let's pause for a minute and remember what our whole purpose in this problem was. This problem started out as y prime equals x squared plus y squared over 2xy. We have gotten to the point where we've been able to take an antiderivative, right? However, our current answer is in terms of what? V. I've got x's and v's in there, right? Well, I mean, I, my answer shouldn't have v's in it because that's a substitution that I made somewhere along the way, and you did too, right? So somehow in the mix of all of this going on, I need to replace that v squared with what? Ah, so what we had said originally was that um, y is equal to vx, right? So if I'm wanting to get rid of my v now, I need to recognize that v is equal to y over x. So I need to take that v and I need to plug back in the y over x that it corresponds to. So this is the natural log of x equals the negative natural log of 1 minus y over x squared again plus that mysterious C1. I think I'm missing a 1. Yeah. yeah, I am. My absolute value. There we go. Better? Okay, so what's left to do? clean it up, right? All right, so how are we going to clean this up? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, 
Eventually, we're going to recognize that we've got a natural log on both sides. So if we did both sides with a base E, we could eliminate the natural log. So that would be a handy feature to do. However, right now, the natural log on the right-hand side has a negative in front of it. So it can't just eliminate with a base of E until that a negative is sort of eliminated in some way. So how could I eliminate that negative? And multiplying everything by negative is not going to be helpful because then I'm going to get a negative on the left. But then I've got a negative on the left. I don't want a negative in front of either of my natural logs. You can make it an exponent, exactly. So this negative is the equivalent of having a negative 1 out here. So I can make this an exponent up here. Now, it's an exponent on the entire expression 1 minus y over x quantity squared. So a negative exponent actually does what to a fraction? Yeah, it flips it, right? So anything that was on the top is now on the bottom. Anything that was on the bottom is now on the top. The problem right now is that what we have inside that absolute value on the right is not one solid fraction. It's a portion of it's a whole number, then I've got the subtraction of a fraction. So I need to combine what's inside of my absolute values there so that it's one complete fraction, okay? So that's not difficult to do. You guys know how to do that. Um, we've got negative, I'm sorry, natural log of absolute value of x on the left. I've got the natural log on the right. If I actually or distribute the squared, this is y squared over x squared, right? And then I can get the common denominator of x squared. So this would be multiplied by x squared over x squared. So the equivalent here is that I have x squared minus y squared over x squared. And I've got a negative 1 exponent, so I'm going to flip that in a minute here. And then I won't have the negative exponent anymore. So this is the natural log of the absolute value of x equals the natural log of the absolute value of x squared over x squared minus y squared plus c1. And then, and only then, am I able to do the base of e to raise it to. But nice things happen there because the natural logs will be eliminated. So I will now have x on the left. And on the right, I have x squared minus y squared over x squared, right? What happens over here with this e? I mean, wh what happens with the e raised to the c1? We've seen this happen before. What happens with the e raised to the c1? Yeah, because there's addition here, and we recognize that when we have write a to the m plus n, I can write this as a to the m times a to the n. So in essence here, I've got that e to the c1 written as a multiplication factor in back. So this right here is um, well, the equivalent of having e to the ln of all of this stuff, all the inside of this stuff. Let me just do it this way. Absolute value times e to the c1, right? That's what I've got on the right-hand side. That e to the c1 is simply some other constant, right? So back here at the back, this is times some c. Some number. We don't know what that number is. That's okay. But it's just times some constant c. I have a question. Yes. So why did you flip it again? Did I flip it? And I rewrote it? I did. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. That's okay. I was just... That's, what happened. That's why I usually copy and paste from the other screen before I... <laughs> Do this x squared minus y squared. All right, there's actually one identically one thing left we can do to simplify this. Um, well, I'll, let me rewrite first. You know what? Let's do it this way. Let's solve it for c so that you can see the simplification easier. If I wanted to solve this for c, that is, I want to say c equals, what would I have to do? Okay, divide by the fraction x squared over x squared minus y squared, but dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the fractions reciprocal. reciprocal. So I can multiply by the x squared minus y squared over x squared on both sides. And what simplification do you see? There's one simplification left. This x with this x squared, right? Mm -hmm. So the resulting equation is c equals x squared minus y squared over x. 
And that's where we end up four slides later. Now you know why there's so much space on your paper for that one. It wasn't just because it was the last problem, right? Takes a little bit. There's a lot going on in that problem in there. Do you have a question, Aaron? Or Chelsea, somebody? Oh, sorry, Taylor. So are we always going to be looking for C? Is that just required? Well, you didn't have to solve this for C, but you did need to recognize that the x and the x squared simplified, and I chose to do that by saying C equals. Your book does that a number of times. If you didn't solve it for C, it'd be okay. But you do need to recognize that that x on the left and that x squared on the right would simplify. It just happened to be nice to solve it for C to C about this particular time. That's a good question. Any other questions on this one? All right.